And uh, yes, no double mute. Eh? Here we are again. The nice still Joan. We have still a few presentations lined up. Uh, so our next speaker, developer Steve, uh, who is joining us. Hi, Steve. I really love your cousin. Where are you joining from? Thank you. Uh, I, I want to say the internet. <laughs> also, <laughs> just a note here. It, it is. I, I'm. I'm in Australia. I'm out in the countryside, and it is currently 30 degrees Celsius. For those that are, are playing at home in Celsius, it's actually really hot and really hot to wear. But it's fun. It's fun. It's been a lot of fun, and we're gonna have way more fun with your presentation. Which, if I can, if I can pronounce the name, I've been practicing the whole night. It says debugging Schrodinger's app. Is that is that the right pronunciation? Perfect. Two uh, Python thumbs up. So, thank you very much, as developer Steve. I just added your your slides. Please feel free to start whenever you feel like, and see you in a moment. Amazing. Thank you. And hello, everyone. You might be wondering why I am in a onesie, and well, this is my first time speaking at um, Pajama Conf. It's so amazing to be here, and I was so excited because I've done like a lot of talks over the years, but. Well, this one I got to do in an orange onesie because it's pajama conf, right? So I hope you're all safe and well, and also wearing your amazing onesies too. Actually, drop me a tweet on uh, or a, a social media anywhere uh, at developer Steve on most platforms. Uh, drop me a tweet with your selfie with uh, your onesie, so as well. Anyway, I digress. I'm going to switch to my slides and reset my timer. There we go. So hello everyone. Really amazing to be here. As I said. My name is developer Steve. I'll get into more about that in a moment. Um, one thing, some things I wanted to mention at the start of my talk, and I hope you all get something from this, other than please don't wear a onesie in summer without a fan on because audio, I want to keep my audio nice and clear. Uh, it's a, it's kind of hot, but it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> it'll keep me on my toes. Um, but uh, as we go along, please drop all comments, questions, and emojis into the chat as we're going. If you're watching this in the future uh, as a, as a pre-record, hello from the past. I hope you are well. Uh, please do not be alarmed if you are watching this in the future. Dinosaurs are not walking amongst us once more. So just wanted to clarify that. Also, I am on the Discord. So please drop any, uh, any messages you want there as well. Um, I do have a disclaimer before we start. Oh, and it's got an asterisk. That makes it twice as bad, right? No, no, no. This, this disclaimer is fine. I have a lot of tech jokes slash developer jokes. I've been a developer advocate for many, many years now. And well, I collected these in my adventures and my travels. My well, this is the first time I've been wearing a dinosaur onesie while presenting. So I've been it's always a first, right? But um, I do have a lot of tech jokes. This is open source, so please take it with you. And I love doing these at the start of my talk because well, it makes everyone smile and that's always important. So how do fallen trees check for errors? You might be thinking, huh, how do fallen trees check for errors? Well, they use log files. Haha, <laughs> there we go. Kind of related to today's talk, but we'll get into that as we go along. I have two demos and a whole bunch of, actually, there is a couple more uh, tech jokes in as we go through. You'll spot them because you'll hear the silent boom, boom. No, I won't play that. But anyway, um, like I said, my name is Developer Steve. I've been a developer advocate uh, for or developer evangelist for a number of years now. Um, I am with uh, a company called Lamigo. Um, I've got a little bit of a demo to do as we go through as well of uh, what, what Lamigo is and how it works. And also OpenTelemetry, because OpenTelemetry is really exciting. But we'll look at that because there's some auto magical ways to do that. Uh, funny story. So I have been a developer advocate for so many years now. I've done many, many conferences. Again, first time in onesie, just for the record. Um, but the I, from all uh, connecting to so many amazing communities and doing so many different events uh, all over the world over since 2014, uh, to think back then, um, everyone started calling me Developer Steve. So when I got married in 2018, that's my wedding phone on the top right, I 3D printed the top of that cake the night before my wedding because I like to live dangerously sometimes. I actually had its own mo mobile number too, but all of the story. Um, yeah, we combined our last names and Kuchin is my married name. So when I legally changed to my married name, I thought I'm going to make developer Steve my middle name because everyone calls me it anyway. So turns out you can do that. And well, I did. <laughs> you know what? I didn't mind though, because I mean, I've been coding for so many years now as well. So since the age of eight, I was basically, which I mean, that was just a few years ago, right? <laughs> well, no, but, um, oops, oh, there we go. Lost my slides. 
Um, I've been coding since the days of QBasic, for those that remember it. Actually, if you do remember it, please drop it in, in the chat or hit me up on Discord, because I always love hearing uh, people's developer origin stories. But I have been writing code since the days of QBasic back in the day. And going through my developer origin story, like that was humble beginnings and always great to, well, get a feel for how code worked. And it, I mean, it was pretty basic as the name suggests, but even going through um, digital agency, uh, building out applications and well, IoT things and all sorts of different crazy wild projects in no time at all was literally organized chaos. Building applications that can not only scale well, but well, I could support them as well in no time at all because, well, it's a pretty chaotic environment. Uh, anyone that's ever worked through digital agencies and sort of building out tight timelines and, well, building out the entire world and supporting it with, uh, well, all, all at the same time is oh, it's often quite troublesome and something you kind of build up a tolerance for in the way that you, when you start to build applications, after a while you start to build them with the idea that, I might be building for very small user group now, but it's going to scale rapidly, like really, really quickly as users adopt it and, well, as users hopefully adopt it and the functionality starts to build out, which kind of brings me to what this talk is about, which is building things that scale from the onset, like from that initial deploying project stage or even just even that concept, building things out with the idea that at some point, you're going to need to build out more robust ways to support this application at scale. And if you think like building a Python application out just for you know building out an idea, but then also deploying it into the cloud native world, you need to really make sure that you're not only uh, monitoring, observing, and sort of doing the right tests so that your end users have a great app application experience, but also that that application isn't costing like huge sums of money when you start to go to like insane scale. And by crazy scale, I mean, you might start out with 10 users now, but you might end up with 10, 100,000 users down the track that that little tiny bug that you didn't, that you may have missed or may not be sort of spotting in production now at that scale is going to cost you not only a lot of money, but also potential users as well. So one of the things I always love, I'm um, a sort of um, multiple language adopter. Like I always uh, try and keep across uh, as much of the different languages as I can as possible. And for me, Python is really cool because it is so versatile. Of course, we already know that because well, we're all sitting in, in our in the, we're all sitting here in, in our pajamas watching this amazing live stream and building out some really really cool apps. But previously, like it was actually one of the first languages beyond basic, of course, that more mature languages that I first started to learn. And I did that by building out a, 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 a game, a, a multiplayer online game with a friend. And I used Python to be able to build out, taught myself Python 2.4 back in the day from memory. That's been a while. Um, to build out using Tickle to build out a game client that would connect into some APIs that one of my friends had built with a, with a, a game server. Which kind of brings me one of the other use cases, like I've used it extensively to also build out APIs. Actually, the APIs for that game were built using Python as well. But um, over the years, I've also built out a number of uh, different other APIs using Python, including um, some uh, financial services APIs, which it's always great for because not only do I find Python as a senior developer, not only do I find Python one of those versatile languages, but also a heavy lifting one too which is another great use case here because as we know, data science loves Python and Python loves it equally back because it is literally one of those heavy lifting languages that you can do any manner of different um, data science projects with. Of course, uh, web-based frameworks in Python, amazingly great to build out a really quick website and then be able to, or a, a web-based application and then be able to expand it like really, really easy as well. And shout out to Django here because it's one of the ones I've used previously. And one of my other favorites, I love Flask. So the application will be I'll be playing with today, I've built in Flask because I like Flask. I really need to put a I love Flask meme in here. Totally, I keep meaning to do it anyway. And of course, Internet of Things. Oh, I love Internet of Things. Actually, I have one on my desk at the moment. I won't pick it up because I'll start talking about it. I'll be here for another hour. But um, yeah, Internet of Things is one of my favorites. Like I said at the start, I actually uh, 3D printed the top of my cake and it had its own mobile number. Um, the guests at my wedding were able to 
message the cake and change the color of the top of the cake. I actually reused that. Um, it was uh, micro Python too. Just thought I'd throw it, uh, mention that. Um, I actually reused that uh, about a year later when I bought this new coffee table and it looked just like an iPad. It was actually unintentional until it turned up. And I was like, oh, this looks like an iPad. I can put lights in that. And then also control them as well. Cause I mean, Python, right? And well, I, I, there was 300 LEDs in this in this coffee table. So of course I was gonna control it with all the things. <laughs> Through all these experiences though, and to um, sort of add to the versatility behind Python, one of the things I've always been mindful of is beyond that that deployment stage, beyond that stage where you've gone, right, the, the requirements for this application, they're all complete, whatnot, let's, let's deploy to cloud. And this is where Schrodinger's rules of observability start to come into play because it's something I've always been mindful of as a dev building out apps. And keep in mind, we as as devs, as technology people, as people wanting to make a difference using using our, our code superpowers, like these applications we build for our end users to be able to do something meaningful in their lives. Part of the part of the the deployment scenario, if you will, is to also make sure we're monitoring these applications too. And this is where Schrodinger's rules of uh, observ uh, observability, oh, that's a tongue twister, or a cat twister, if you will. Yes, let's go with that. Um, come into play because this was essentially a, a, a thought experiment that kind of aptly describes the quantum world, but it also applies to other things like application development. Because unless you are observing the application, the deployed application, even in, in whatever stage it's in, unless you're observing that application, you won't know whether it's throwing an error or it is throwing an error or what it's actually doing. And so Schrodinger's rules are that it, it well, it's a, um, a paradox of quantum superposition, but in an application standpoint is you won't know whether there's an error or no error if you aren't observing it at all. In fact, it's actually doing both at the same time until you're observing it, that it, it isn't throwing any errors, if that makes sense. Of course, in dealing with building out, or, uh, building out um, local Python applications, this is really easy to do because there's a multiple of ways to do it. So you can use the core language platform debugging options like print, logging, PDB, et cetera. And these are all built in and ready to go inside the core framework now. Then of course you can use different libraries. Like, I mean, one of my favorites, pprint, because well, it's really handy for dumping out um, dictionaries or arrays to be able to see what's in there and if it's in the right position that I was be expecting it to do it in. And then of course you can use IDEs as well with uh, any variety of plugins. And some of the plugins will actually use those aforementioned methods to be able to do some debugging like live while you're building the code out, which is always super, super handy. And that's for the likes of VS Code, Eclipse, and well, whatever, whatever other tools, v or IDE tools that you're using as well. So this is where we, oh, this is our first Python joke. Oh, um, this is where um, this application uh, is one of the demos we built out to be able to not only demonstrate how these errors can occur, but also ways that you can debug and find them. So this is what I aptly call Schrodinger's Python app. <laughs> um, now, what do you call 8 bits in Python? This is a bit of an old joke. So if you do know it, please drop it into the chat. And well, please drop it in the chat, but you call it a snake bite. Oh, see, but I can feel the face palms. It's always really weird. Anyway, I didn't say they were good jokes, but I did have a whole bunch of them. <laughs> anyway, this application, uh, I'll have the code at the end of my talk if you wanna go play with it. It's containerized and also you can run local as uh, locally as well. And like I said, it's a Flask app but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It's essentially a, a to-do app. So, well, it is a to-do app. So um, yeah, you enter some to-do items and I've got some little like uh, little things in there so you can test some HTTP statuses and whatnot. But let, I don't wanna give away spoilers. Let's go look at that in a moment. Um, so inside this application, just to talk through how it actually works, of course, I, as I said, I was, it's, it's Flask because, well, it's Python and Flask because I love the two together. I don't think you can do it without it. Anyway, it's a Python Flask app that uses Alchemy for some basic databasing. Uh, there's an SQLite database that it creates uh, on its own as well that it uses to store its to-do items and then remember them and make sure they're there. It's a, a fairly uh, basic uh, database schema-wise, but it doesn't need to be complex and we'll keep it simple. 
there's a couple of routes in there. So for starters, uh, and there's a couple beyond the ones that I, I'll talk about here, but we'll get into that and we get to it. There's a to-do, which will just uh, a get to-do. So obviously just gets all the to-dos out from the SQL outcome database. Uh, it posts, it'll handle some post queries so you can create new items, um, update the status of, so you can map them as complete, et cetera. And then you can delete them as well. Huh, which brings us to our first demo. Just going to switch back quickly to make sure oop, no comments. Everything looks like it's working and the wheels haven't fallen off yet. And there's no mes messages from anyone. Oh, this makes me sad. Please drop some emojis into the chat now. Just, yeah, get creative with the emojis. Anyway, <laughs> dinosaur ones. Put dinosaur ones in there. All right. So let me switch over to my code. There we go. And now I can see that my Triceratops heads out of the way. Oh, that's better. Uh, so this is my code. Hopefully you can all see it fairly well. Yep, looks like you should be able to. Uh, if you can't, please drop in the chat and I'll make things bigger, but I tried to get everything to line up. Uh, so this is my code here. I've got, uh, like I said, I've got some basic routes in here, like doing some get, some add, handling some post queries, and delete and update. There's a couple others, but we'll look at those in a second. And like I said, with the thing, like when you're working locally, obviously, is you can use a multiple of different ways to be able to see well, what the application's doing. So if I do that, oh, actually hit a extra character there. And now I've just learned that it's actually sanitizing because it didn't break. This is good. This is good. Nothing like testing live. I don't recommend doing that at home. Anyway, as you can see, as I'm interacting with the app, of course, I've got Flask in debug mode. and I can see exactly what it's doing. And if there's any errors, I'm able to fix that. But I want to make sure that I can see those errors occurring. So I've got a couple of little fun things. Let me delete that one. Fun things uh, sort of built in so that I can test like HTTP route status errors, for example. So if I click cat, you can see it's created this extra button called cat here, which is kind of funny because, well, it's Schrodinger's cat is, is the thought experiment is kind of the idea for the app. So if I click that now, you can see on the right-hand side in the debugger, I can actually see it's created a 400. And Flask, of course, is handling that as it, as it would expect. So it's actually redirecting me back. It's throwing a bit of an error and then redirecting me back. Now, if I click cat again, it's going to start cycling through the 400. So I can start to cater for particular HTTP statuses as they occur as well. And if I click that back, I actually think that may actually be happy, unhappy with that. Even more unhappy with that one because that was a 401. There we go. Now I'm getting a 402. And I can go to like keep going through that and it's just going to keep throwing the statuses. And at the same time, I can see what this app will do and what the infrastructure that it's running on, in this case, just local. Um, what it, how it can actually handle those. I can also do, and I've got this one built in, a particular status type. So HTTP status 418, that is my favorite. You might be thinking, why would someone have a favorite HTTP status? I mean, other than 200, of course, which is everything works fine. 418 is I'm a teapot. It's still one of my favorites because it means nothing and it doesn't do anything, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> anyway, have a look at, have a hey, look that one up, 418. It, yeah, I'm a teapot. Got introduced one time as an April Fool's Day joke, and well, it's never left. Never left. I'm kind of glad though, because well, while it doesn't do anything, it's just fun. But if I create that one now, you can see it's going to send that through as well. And as expected, it doesn't really do anything other than just send a fun status through to my app, but it seems to handle it okay. That was kind of the first demo. So you can see there, like debugging, relatively easy. But if we go to deploy this application, that's where things get a little bit interesting. And again, if you think like building out a, a local demo to be able to, you know, uh, prove an idea or at a hackathon, just build out, uh, you know, the, the team's uh, project that they want to build in, in the time frame. But the next stage of any project, even just building out an idea for something you want to do, like a, 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 a IoT cake or, <laughs> or a coffee table, is just part of the part of the process because inevitably at some point someone's going to come over and see that particular thing and everyone's going to all of a sudden want to use it or buy it or do it themselves or maybe you need to do a write-up for it. So building for scalability is always always super important from the from the early stage onset. 
Now I'm going to mention here too, when you start to think about deploying to cloud and scalability, you think you get to think like, uh, you know, uh, scaling the database and scaling the web server and all the infrastructure that sort of runs that particular application, which is entirely doable and fairly easy, but you need to make sure that you've got the right, right processes in place from the start. Now, Special mention for this phrase because I've been here and it's always my first thought whenever anyone always sort of goes to, well, there's a, there's a problem for that particular app. And I'm like, but it was working fine when I was running it in my Docker. Like it was, it was fine when it was working in my, in, in my environment. And when you think like a deployed application across cloud native infrastructure, you've got a lot of moving parts and a lot of components. And any one of those can cause an error, which will have downstream effects on completely unrelated, potentially unrelated parts of your application. And that's the thing with cloud native environments is there are literally many, many components that will sit behind various elements of your deployed applications to enable them to not only scale super quick, but also be able to reuse functionality like really, really easily. And quite often, like these can start off relatively simple, particularly as you're building out that that, um, that idea or that project in its early stages and become rather complex sort of down the track as you add more services in or maybe there's a new feature on a cloud being announced at a particular conference. Shout out to AWS uh, conference this week and reInvent in Vegas. There's going to be so many announcements. If, even with that, um, you can imagine, or as we see in the industry, industry quite regularly is that one service which has been running for many, many years all of a sudden gets a whole bunch of new features very quickly which may depreciate some of the features that you're already using inside your app and may not realize because there is so many announcements often in, in the cloud native space. And all of a sudden you get that one error appear in that one service across, maybe even just in that one region across the multiple regions you're running in. But ultimately it's going to mean, well, the Murphy's law raises its head at the most unopportune times, right? And you're probably gonna get a call at either 2 a.m. someday or on a Friday evening when you're trying to play that particular game and you're halfway in, you've just been deployed to the island and yeah, you get that alert to say, hey, there's something wrong. It needs to be fixed. Like, fix it now. Why is it broken? Fix it. Murphy's Law often knocks when you don't want it to do do that. And well, you want to make sure you've got the right tools in place to be able to spot it. And this is where distributed tracing can help because it can take that multitude of services sitting behind your application and put it into some nice order and create a nice little, I like to think of this as an adventure map. So, and if you think about it, like having that that end to end trace behind a transaction kind of helps because you can, you can see that your application triggers this service, which passes a message into this service, which then gets a response from this SDK, which then in turn does this, all this other stuff. And being able to see that nice lineup means that you can identify where the error is appearing inside the flow and maybe investigate and sort of understand that it's not actually an error occurring in that particular spot in the flow, but something that happened two lines away, three services up in a, a mountainous region of this fantasy land that your application is uh, adventuring in. And you know what I mean. <laughs> I just wanted to tie it back to something fun. But this is where distributed tracing is able to tie in and spot where that particular error is occurring as part of your application's flow. The best part is, and like, I've been here so many times over the years, this is all agentless. <gasps> Wait, I have a fun meme I'm going to drop here. There we go. <gasps> agentless. Um, this is all done ages, 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 uh, I can't say it, but you know what I'm trying to say. This is all done without the use of agents. So you don't need to keep anything running on your particular uh, server infrastructure, your cloud native environment, or even just having a service running alongside your production environment to be able to spot everything. This is all done through uh, some, uh, well, an amazing new uh, implementation inside uh, of the tech industry, or which is becoming really widely adopted, called Open Telemetry. And I've seen a few folks at the conference talk about this and uh, Open Telemetry, and I think it's great, uh, a great way to standardize not only the logging and the metrics and traces that uh, applications, platforms, and infrastructure are generating now, because like I've been through that entire world of like digging through logs. I think we all have at some point, digging through logs to find that particular one thing, that needle in the haystack that you may or may not find, but you need to identify because there's a, an error or there's a ticket being raised for an error. 
open telemetry helps solve this because it's an industry standard um, cloud, vendor neutral way to be able to handle logging metrics and traces from applications and from infrastructure and cloud native as well. So, and it's it's been around since, open telemetry has been around since 2019 and it's part of the cloud native uh, foundation as well, which is great. That industry standard approach just means that one, you don't get vendor locked into anyone to be able to use anyone's particular, or you shouldn't be, anyone's um, particular company way to uh, use open telemetry to trace your application. Friends don't let friends do that. Using pure open uh, open telemetry approach means that you can not only avoid that, but you can make sense of your application too. The best part is, and shout out to the open telemetry community here, best part is because of that um, industry standard and community approach to being able to handle traces of metric data, there's a multiple of uh, branches within the overall overarching community that are building out more commonplace uh, implementations of different languages and different stacks and ways to integrate very seamlessly and very easily. So as you can see there, there's a Python one and I'm going to say other languages because this is a Python, Python conference and we love Python. But there's a whole bunch of other languages there too. Now, shout out again, shout out to the community and communities sort of here uh, as part of the Open Telemetry group. Uh, if you are looking to use any one of the components, please contribute back where you can. It's always important uh, as adopters of open source, as products of open source, that we contribute back uh, when we can. Um, so please, if you already are, thank you. Thank you, thank you. See, you've got somebody in a dinosaur onesie saying thank you for contributing. How awesome is that? <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for any contribs that you do. If you are looking to get involved, uh, this is a really great community. They're, they've got a Slack group and everything you'll need to know to get started on their website as well and to also get up and running with it. Um, so yeah, please contribute back to where you can. Um, at Lamigo, we do uh, we do contribute back to the core project and we also maintain a number of our own open source traces based on pure open telemetry approach. Again, friends don't let friends get vendor locked in and we're very proud to support that as well. Uh, our open, tel uh, open telemetry traces that we're going to be looking at one of them in a moment, uh, you basically install them. So just pip install the tracer. Reference in the code is literally just importing the library, like that's it. It's kind of cool, um, auto magical. Woo. And set two environmental variables, which I'm not going to show you with the platform because one of them is also my uh, token. So yeah, anyway, can help you through it if anyone needs to set it up and we've got it all written up, written up in our documentation. But the two uh, environmental variables the distribution library needs is the token for your uh, free tier account, which is what I'm using here and also the service name that you want to appear in the traces. Yeah, that's kind of it. Um, it's really easy to set up. Uh, so like before, this is this next demo uses the, well, uses the same demo, but I've containerized it. Ooh, Docker, how awesome is Docker? Uh, I've got that running on an ECS and I've also hooked up SQS using some environmental variables, but I'll show you that one in a second too. Again, this is to just demonstrate how OpenTelemetry can help you trace your app and then be able to, well, do some traces yourself. And then, of course, I'm using OpenTelemetry to uh, pick up some metrics uh, auto-magically. Demo two. Oh, I'm on time. Well, I'm pretty close to time. I only got a few more slides after this one. So the code bits we're going to be looking at this time in particular are the well using the variables the environmental variables which i've got set in my app can't show you that one either because i did that one time and people started sending messages through my uh my queue so yeah i won't do that one but you, you know how they work also i've got instructions for this on the repo as well so if you check that out if you want as well uh, the other one is oh yeah so I do have the open, like the Lamigo open telemetry distribution in here to be able to do some traces that we'll look at quickly. Um, literally, that is the only code that I've got in there particular to that. Like, that's it. It just loads a library and sends through all its magic, all its open telemetry to be able to see some great tracing. Anyway, that was, I think that was it for that one. Uh, this is the ECS that I've got running. Uh, as you can see, well, I'm not going to click through to the task because that is where the environmental variables are actually visible. And I like you all, but I'm not going to give away my tokens. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, again, check out the repo. You'll be able to see it all there. Uh, so <gasps> oh, there was an error there and then it quickly fixed itself. Isn't that great? 
See, that's where Murphy's Law decides to goes to come and then goes away. That's what we like. Well, actually, that it doesn't come at all. But anyway, if it's going to do it, at least do it that way. Um, I've already got my uh, AWS account hooked up to Lumigo. That's quick and easy to do. Like, and then through that, it's able to trace some basic. Uh, it'll not only spot your containers running, like you can see there, but it will also see any uh, serverless functions you've got running and trace those as well without even doing anything, which is kind of cool. What that library though does is also adds some traces at the transaction level inside the container. So it's like further information is able to come out on each transaction. Let me show you what I mean. So if I do some tests like I did before, which we're all going to run fairly similarly to before. So I'm going to throw some, actually, I'm not going to do the cat one. I'm going to throw my favorite, 418. There we go. <gasps> it broke. Oh no. Um, so I'm going to finish that one. Actually, let's do cat as well. There we go. So that'll send through, yeah, that'll send through some different ones. Now, two of the other, I'll just clean those up so that everything stays on screen really good. There we go. I do need to add a reverse sort. So the newest one appears at the top. We'll add that to, to the to-do on the to-do. Anyway, that just went down a whole other Schrodinger's thought experiment rabbit hole. But this other one I've got set up is called Meow. So what this will do is put multiple Meow messages into Qt, which will be able to end and trace from the container directly into SQS as part of like a holistic transaction view. So if I keep clicking that now, it should, there we go. It's going to do multiple meows. And as I keep clicking that through, that will then appear as a end-to-end -end trace inside as part of the, our open telemetry tracer. That's probably enough meowing. So now if I click the see traces button, or I can just click into transactions tab, but uh, let's go to transactions tab. Hey, there we go there. So I should start to see there's an error there that you can see. And I can click through that and then see sort of more detail about the particular error that occurred. And also some really nice, easy to see log entries associated just to that transaction, which is one of the one of the things I love the most is I don't have to dig through like all those logs because oh, done that before and that yeah, that hurts. <laughs> that hurts worse than more than wearing a onesie in summer in front of a whole bunch of lights. Whole other story. This one time I did it for a couple, oh, you're here. Anyway, <laughs> with the end-to-end -end traces though, this is these are the meows that I was sending through. You'll be able to see like from the application itself, you can see there the route that's come through is called meow one. Actually, let me just make sure that's big enough. There we go. That's called meow one. And then I can actually trace that through to, well, the route's called meow one, but it would have triggered meow two because it was uh, incrementing adding one, which is the body that message that it sent through to the SQS. And you can see that there as well. So as I go through and use the application or users are using the application, you can flag particular errors or particular instances that are occurring really easily, but uh, then also see further information just for that particular transaction and invocation as they're occurring, which is really, really cool because it ultimately means it's less time that I'm going to be digging around looking for, well, anything that I need to find out to be able to do any sort of uh, intelligence gathering for a particular error or trace that I'm looking for. So you can see like things super, super quickly and super, super easy. See, there's that 418. Um, oh, see, I'm a teapot. It's my favorite one. Anyway, yay, second demo worked. Let me switch back and almost done. And then I'll switch back to the app and see if there's any questions. So just some takeaways and some things to think about other than the fact that, yay, both demos worked and you want to get hands on with the code, the code will be available. I'll show you in the next slide. But um, always remember to build for scale. Like no matter what you're doing, those humble beginnings building out just from the moment you do get in it, you're basically buying tech debt. So make sure you future-proof yourself as much as possible. Not even yourself. Might be someone else that'll be picking up the that particular app down the track. Always make sure you document your your thoughts and even where the application was intended to go, just so those uh, that particular section of the app that someone may pick up in the in that future time. Like make sure you've got you help them out as much as you're going to help yourself uh, in in the long run. So always document as well. I should add that as a point, but um, rinse, repeat, and refine, like work out what works, work out what works well, and then also be always looking to refine how that particular part of an application is working. 
there's always ways to make an app better in particular so that it uses less resources, saves the user's time and ultimately costs you, uh, save you money or saves your resources. And monitor and trace everything. That's super important across the board. So no matter what you're building out, make sure you're looking to deploy with that in mind um, because you're going to future-proof yourself, not only future-proof yourself well, but you'll future-proof everyone using the app down the track. And your end users will thank you for it. I'd like to think they would thank you for it, but if there's no problems, they're probably not going to know. That's a whole other thought experiment there. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Please grab the code for yourself. I'm always looking for um, uh, contributions, always looking for people to help make it better. Um, and also stars. If you want to add a star to it, I won't say no. In fact, thank you in advance. <laughs> um, and just finally, please always remember, use your tech superpowers for good. You probably all do anyway, so thank you. Um, and remember to be excellent to each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, developer Steve. Uh, great presentation. People were uh, at the shop, people said, love your energy. So I love your energy as well. Uh, especially, especially that I use it's summer. How, how can you have energy in the summer? We all, we all have. So I, I have a question here for you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, I was going to say, it, yeah, it is actually uh, quite hot in here, but my energy is keeping me cool, I guess. So let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so the question reads, are you able to use it with GitHub Actions? Yes, you can. I haven't set that up yet, but always looking for contributors. But yes, yes, you can. Yes. Uh, so that's the only question I have. Uh, um, but... Uh, Anything that you want to say before closing, closing insights? Actually, I want to ask you, uh, I have two things. I want to ask you a question. One of my favorite yeah. ways to ask uh, any, anyone in tech is, what was your first computer? Oh, my first computer, this is a very long story, but I will make it short. Uh, so I had the opportunity back in 2000 to build my own computer. Uh, I was in college and I remember that at college, we didn't have, the computer didn't have hard drive. So you needed to use a floppy disk and Boot the old operating system, then take out the operating system OS and use the software to you know to do Cobol Pascal. Uh, so I built my computer with a Pentium Pentium two Pentium yeah Pentium two. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I just want to say thank you to all the organizers for putting this on. It's a lot of work, and yeah, thank you. Uh, and everyone in the community, please drop a message in the chat. Thank the organizers. Yeah, uh, thank you, yeah, as uh, all the organizers. Um, and I think with this, we're closing this section five, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, but I want you to stay here. I mean, take a break. Go eat something. Go have some rest. Go stretch your legs. It's been a it's been a long day, but we still have a presentation. That's a good thing. So I want you to take a break and everyone, and come back later. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, developer Steve. And I hope to keep talking to you during the... In, in the in the metaverse, right? <laughs> Maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.